Hello and welcome to today's edition of Daily News Simplified. The what, where and how of the newspaper analysis. And in today's DNS, that is dated 26th of October, we are covering Indian Express and the Hindu newspaper. And we have divided this discussion in two segments. In the first prelim-centric segment, we will be covering three articles, first of which is on the Jamrani Dam project and this will be followed by two discussions on white phosphorus as well as Bodh Gaya. Whereas in the main centric discussion, we will start off with fertilizer subsidy regime and then we will proceed to simultaneous election. Then towards the end, we will discuss the ethics committee of Lok Sabha which is in news recently. Hence to start off our today's discussion, we will start off with this article that appeared on page 7 of the Hindu newspaper. Now this article in particular, it deals with the cabinet's approval to a Jamrani dam project which is situated in the Nanital district of Uttarakhand. Now this dam project, it will be providing several benefits to its nearby residents and it will be completed by the year of 2028. Now this dam project, it is situated in the river Gola, which is a right bank tributary of river Ganga. Now upon its completion in the year of 2028, it will have several benefits for the nearby residents. First of all, this project, it will provide drinking water for the residents of Haldwani district, which is in Uttarakhand. Whereas it will also provide for generation of hydroelectricity through a nearby plant which is of 14 megawatt capacity. Further, this project will also provide for irrigation facilities up to 50, 57,000 hectares of land and it will be covering four districts in particular. The first is Udham Singh Nagar district as well as Nanital district which is located in Uttarakhand as well as Rampur and Bareilly districts of state of Uttar Pradesh. Now why are we discussing this article? Because this dam project, it is situated on a tributary of river Ganga. And UPSC in the past have asked questions related to tributaries of various rivers. For example, in the year of 2015, UPSC asked a question on tributaries of Godavari river and hence we have curated a question based on tributaries of Ganga river. Now before discussing this question, let us first understand where the river Ganga originates from and what are its different tributaries. The first origin of river Ganga, it starts from the Gangotri glacier which is located in the state of Uttarakhand. Now when this river flows, it is met with other rivers such as Nandakani, Alaknanda, Dholi Ganga as well as Pinder river and the confluence of this river with Gangotris, they are called as Prayags. Now this river, when it reaches the plains of state of Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand, it is met with different tributaries on its both left and right hand side. On its left hand side, it is met with Ram Ganga, Gomti, Ghagra, Gandak, Kosi as well as Mahananda rivers. Whereas on its right hand side, river Ganga, it is met, it is, it meets with Yamuna, Betwa, Kane, Son as well as Punpun rivers. Hence, let us now proceed to the model question. Now this model question, it asks us to discuss what are the following tributaries of Ganga river. Now, as we have discussed in the previous slide, Ram Ganga, Mahananda as well as Gomti river, they are tributaries of Ganga river. Whereas this Purna river, it is not a tributary of Ganga river, rather it is a tributary of Godavari river. Hence, only three, that is C option, is the correct answer. Whereas PYQ is concerned, option D was the right answer. Now let us move to the second article of the day which discusses the
the legality of white phosphorus chemical. Now, why are we discussing this particular news? Because use of chemicals in warfare, it is determined by a chemical convention on chemical weapons, which is a multilateral agreement. Hence, UPSC in GS paper 2, it asks us the topic which are related to bilateral, regional as well as global agreements which involve India's interest. Hence, we are dealing with this question in particular because UPSC in the year of 2016, it asked us a question related to organization of prohibition for chemical weapons. Now, this chemical weapon convention, which regulates the use of chemicals in warfare, it is regulated by this very particular organization. Hence, this topic is important from prelims point of view. Now, before discussing this model question on white phosphorus, we will first understand what is this white phosphorus chemical. Now, this white phosphorus, it is a white to yellow colored waxy solid chemical and it has a unpleasant garlic like smell. Now, this chemical, it burns instantaneously, that is on temperatures which are more than 30 degrees centigrade. And upon burning, it creates dense and white irritating smoke. Hence, this chemical is used in military purposes. Now, this use of this chemical, it is regulated by a chemical weapons convention, which is administered by Organization for Prohibition on Chemical Weapons. And this organization, it is situated in the Hague of Netherlands. Now, this chemical weapons convention, it regulates the use of different chemicals. For example, white phosphorus, it has several applications. The first, that it is used for industrial purposes, that is, for manufacture of chemicals such as phosphoric acid, as well as other phosphate or phosphorus based chemicals. Further, it is also used as a rodenticide as well as for firework purposes. Whereas in military use, this chemical, it is utilized as a smoke screen. As this smoke screen, it is utilized to hide our military's movement as well as to stop the, to stop these enemies from detecting our movement. Further, this chemical is also used as an incendiary weapon. By incendiary, we mean weapons which are used to producing burning effects such as hand grenades and other artillery shells. Now, upon exposure to this chemical, it causes several harmful effects. For example, it creates several burns on our skins as well as cause respiratory damage if we are able to inhale this particular chemical. Further, it also impairs the mobility of people who survive this effect of exposure to this chemical. Hence, this particular chemical, it is very harmful for us humans. However, this chemical weapon convention, it regulates the use of chemicals. And through its article 1, it prohibits the use of incendiary chemicals. However, it has a several exemption which is provided in Article 1b of this convention. As munitions which are used by military and they have a subsidiary harmful effects which might be intended, they are provided with exemption from use of this chemical weapons convention. And in this regard, white phosphorus, it is exempted from this chemical weapons convention. Hence, let us now move to the model question. Now consider the following statements with reference to white phosphorus. The first statement, it asks us that it is a gaseous substance that can be used as for multi-purpose munition. Now as we have already discussed, it is a solid component, solid compound and not a gaseous compound. Hence this statement is incorrect. Now the second statement, it states that the white phosphorus is also used for production of phosphoric acid and as a rodenticide. 
as we have already discussed, this statement is correct. Whereas the third statement, it says that the use of white phosphorus is explicitly restricted under the Chemical Weapons Convention. Now, as we have discussed, this Chemical Weapon Convention, it exempts the use of white phosphorus in warlike situations. Hence, this third statement is incorrect. Thereby, only one statement is correct, thus making option A the correct answer. Whereas the PYQ is concerned, option B was the correct answer. Now, let us move to the third article of the day, which appeared on page 11 of the Hindu newspaper. Now, this article in particular, it deals with the site of Bodh Gaya, which has a huge significance for the Buddhist religion. Now, why are we discussing this article? Because UPSC in GS paper 1, it deals with various aspects of Indian culture and hence Bodh Gaya is a significant aspect of Indian culture. Further, important historical sites such as Ajanta Caves, Sanchi Stupa, Pandulena Caves as well as Amravati Stupa, they were asked by UPSC in the prelims of the year 2021. Hence, in similar fashion, we have curated this MCQ based on historical sites of Buddhism. Now, before discussing this historical site, let us first discuss what are significant historical sites with relation to Buddhist religion. Now, Buddhist religion, it says that there are eight great places which are also known as Asthans. Now, these Asthans, they include Lumbini, Bodh Gaya, Sarnath as well as Kushinagar districts, which are foundational sites of this Buddhist religion. Whereas there are also four other sites and these are Sravasti, Rajgriha, Vaishali as well as Sankasya. Now this Bodh Gaya, it is situated on the banks of Niranjana river, which is also known as Falgur river in ancient texts. Now this Bodh Gaya has immense historical significance for Buddhist religion because it was there where Lord Buddha he attained enlightenment, which is also known as Nibbana, in the under a Bodhi tree. And this Bodhi tree is situated under the Bodh Gaya district. Further, Emperor Ashoka, he also constructed a temple at this particular place. Now, let us discuss four other important sites with relation to Buddhist religion. The first important site is the Lumbini district which is situated currently in the country of Nepal. Now this is significant for Buddhism because this is where Lord Buddha was born. Whereas second site, it is called as Bodh Gaya and as we have already discussed, it is the site where Lord Buddha, he enriched or attained enlightenment. Whereas the third district, it is called as Sarnath and it is specifically important for Buddhism because it is where Lord Buddha, he delivered his first sermon, which is also known as Dharm Chakra Parivartan. Now, the fourth site, it was Kushinagar and it is important because this is where Lord Buddha died. And hence, in Kushinagar, we can say that Lord Buddha, he attained final salvation and release from the cycle of birth and death. Now, let us discuss the model question. With reference to re historical sites with Buddhism, consider the following statements. Now, first statement, it says that Rajgriha and Sankasya are an important site considered as part of Asthan in Buddhism. Now, as we have already discussed, statement 1 is correct. Whereas second statement, it states that Bodh Gaya is situated on Niranjana river, which was also known as Falgu river. Hence, this statement is also correct. Whereas Kushinagar is associated with Dharm Chakra Parivartan in event of Buddhism. And this statement is incorrect because Kushinagar was where the Lord Buddha died. And it was Sarnath where Lord Buddha delivered the Dharm Chakra Parivartan or his first sermon. 
Hence, in this regard, option B is the right answer because two statements are correct. Whereas the PYQ is concerned, option A was the right answer. Now let us move to the next article of the day which is a men's centric discussion and it is on the issue of fertilizer subsidy regime in the country. Now this article appeared today because central government it has approved more than 22,300 crores for subsidy related to fertilizers. And why are we discussing this topic in particular? Because UPSC in GS paper 3 highlights the issue related to direct and indirect farm subsidies. And this question in particular, which are related to direct and indirect farm subsidies, it appeared recently in the mains of the year 2023. Further, in the year of 2015, a question appeared on effectiveness of direct benefit transfer for fertilizer subsidy regime or subsidy regime in general. Hence, we will discuss the fertilizer subsidy regime in our today's discussion. Now what are chemical fertilizers? Now these fertilizers, they are used to provide nutrients to soils which are usually deficient in most of the important nutrients. And this chemical product, it is manufactured in a factory. Now these chemical fertilizers, they are primarily of two types. The first, they are called as primary fertilizers which are based on types of nutrient that they supply to the soil. For example, nitrogenous, phosphatic as well as potassium based fertilizers are categorized as primary fertilizers. Whereas the second category, it is called as secondary subsid fertilizers and it utilizes and this fertilizer, it provides components such as calcium, magnesium as well as sulfur to soils. Further, these secondary subs fertilizers, they also provide for micronutrients such as iron, boron as well as chlorine to the soil. Now these fertilizers are in particular, they are important for increasing the productivity of our crops. And after the green revolution in 1960s, Government of India, it realized the importance of these chemical fertilizers for increasing the production of Indian food grains and hence it was felt essential that these fertilizers are provided to farmers in a timely manner and at an affordable cost. But to provide these fertilizers to farmers at an affordable cost, the government, it needed to provide subsidies to these fertilizer companies. Now with progress of time, this fertilizer subsidy regime has evolved into two different subsidy regimes. The first subsidy mechanism, it is covered for specifically for urea, which is a source for nitrogen based fertilizer. Now the subsidy for urea, it is provided through this urea based subsidy scheme, which is a central, sec central sector scheme of government of India. Now this scheme in particular, it fixed the prices of fertilizers, specifically urea and this urea, it is available to farmers at a statutory controlled MRP. Now how is this MRP and subsidy determined? It is determined from what is called a cost plus method, where production cost of fertilizers, it is subtracted from the MRP and the difference, it is calculated as a subsidy. Now naturally from this equation, you can understand that more is the production cost of fertilizer, more is the subsidy outgo by the government. Hence, any manufacturer of urea he is not incentivized to reduce this production cost because he will be getting the difference that is subsidy from the government. Hence, upon realizing this inconsistency, what government did was that it brought upon a new urea policy in the year of 2015. And in this new urea policy, what the government did is that it categorized this manufacturers of 
fertilizers into three different categories and each of this category is given a fixed subsidy which is irrespective of their production cost and hence with this move what government wanted to do was to reduce this subsidy outgo <coughs> i'm sorry which was for urea regime whereas other non urea based fertilizers they are covered from what is called a nutrient based subsidy regime and this nutrient based subsidy regime it covers 22 fertilizers other than obviously urea and now these 22 fertilizers they are available in market based on prices which are determined by market itself hence government it does not fix the mrp of these non urea fertilizers and the production cost as well as other market factors it determines the pricing of these particular fertilizers now this government what it provides is that it provides fixed subsidy to manufacturer of these fertilizers and this subsidy is fixed on a per year basis as you can see from this diagram components of various fertilizers such as nitrogen phosphorus potash as well as sulfur the amount of these components in a fertilizer this determines the amount of subsidy which is paid by the government and this subsidy it is decided on an annual basis hence we can say that this provides for a less based subsidy regime and the subsidy it is provided by the government not to a farmer but rather it is transferred to a direct benefit transfers into accounts of fertilizer manufacturers now this fertilizer subsidy it is provided after the sale of fertilizer takes place through the retailers and this sale it is linked with aadhar of a particular farmer hence the government knows how much amount of fertilizer is being sold in the market and hence gives this subsidy accordingly to the manufacturers now this subsidy in regime in general it has brought forward many issues let us discuss these issues in the next slide now naturally fertilizer subsidy it imposes a huge fiscal burden on the government for example in the financial year of the 22 and 23 government of india it provided for rupees 2.25 lakh crores of fertilizer subsidy which accounts for about 0.82% of nation's gdp hence you can see that this fertilizer subsidy it imposes a huge fiscal burden on our government further as we have already discussed in the previous slide the subsidy of a particular commodity such as fertilizer it is directly dependent on the production cost of that fertilizer hence more is the production cost more is the subsidy that is given by the government and this regime in particular it promotes inefficiency on account of manufacturers as manufacturers specifically that of urea they have no incentive to reduce their production cost because the difference in production cost and statutory controlled mrp it is anyway provided by the government of india hence we can say that this particular regime it promotes inefficiency on the part of government further there are also limited awareness on accounts of farmers because urea it is available at a price which is less than other fertilizers hence these farmers what they do is that they overuse this urea and it leads to imbalanced use of fertilizers now because of limited awareness these farmers they are not aware of the negative effect what urea can do to different aspects for example when urea and its components such as nitrogen it percolates to our ground water it makes our drinking water unfit for human consumption whereas on the other hand overuse overuse of urea it also declines the quality of soil fertility whereas these nitrogen and other chemicals when they percolate to a nearby water body it also creates 
a phenomena what is called as eutrophication where in a water body algal bloom takes place and it results into decline of marine flora and fauna of that particular body hence farmers they are not aware of this negative effects that overuse of fertilizers can lead to further subsidy regime in our country is it is also regressive because currently there are not any limitation on the amount of fertilizer that a particular farmer can use hence for example big farmers they use more fertilizers when compared to small farmers hence we can say that these big farmers they utilize more subsidy as compared to small farmers and hence we can say that the nature of this particular fertilizer subsidy in general it is regressive in nature further fertilizer subsidy it is also accounted for when we calculate amount of subsidy provided by government as per the agreement of agriculture which was brought forward by wto and this agreement of agriculture it limited that a government specifically indian government it can only provide subsidy based on 10% of its total agricultural production value however when we increase the amount of subsidy by the government this poses a risk of breaching this 10% limit which is said by wto hence it means that india can be involved in a conflict with other parties of wto now after we have discussed what are the issues related to fertilizer subsidy let us now discuss what are the initiatives that have been taken by government of india to reduce this financial outgo on fertilizer subsidy now what the government of india it did was that it reduced the size of urea bag previously the size of urea bag was that of 50 kg whereas then it was reduced to 45 kg per bag size and this means farmers who are accustomed to use number of particular number of bags they are reducing their use of urea which automatically means less use of urea will lead to less financial outgo on our fertilizer subsidies further as we have already discussed in the previous slide there is a tendency among farmers to overuse urea and this has led to imbalanced use of fertilizer in particular in every areas hence to regulate this use of imbalanced fertilizers government of india it introduced what is called a soil health card scheme and in this scheme what government did that it provided farmers with a soil health card and this soil health card it recommended farmers particular type of fertilizer as well as nutrition which is required for their particular crop hence farmer they are increased with information which are related to particular types of fertilizers which they can utilize for their growing purposes hence this soil health card scheme what it led to decrease in use of urea and cost of fertilizer which a farmer has to bear and in total it has led to reduction of 8 to 10% of fertilizers all over india in the past 5 years further what government did was it that it introduced neem coating of urea and in this scheme 100% of urea which is manufactured in india it is coated with neem and it has two benefits neem coated urea it provides slow dissolution of fertilizer to the soil hence make use of fertilizer prolonged further it also removes the issue which are related to diversion of fertilizer for other industrial purposes hence in total what it did was it increased the use efficiency of urea and also reduced the diversion of urea which related to which resulted into savings of fertilizer subsidy further government recently it also introduced nano urea and this nano based urea 
what it does that it improves the nitrogen use efficiency of urea hence we can see that less amount of urea is utilized for a particular area and this in long term will reduce the amount of urea which is required in indian economy in general further there is also a problem that some farmers they are fixated with a particular brand of fertilizer for example chambal fertilizer which is produced in state of rajasthan it is in high demand in state of up hence chambal fertilizer it is transferred or transported right from rajasthan state to up state whereas ifco branded fertilizer it is in huge demand in state of rajasthan and it is transported from a factory in uttar pradesh to that of rajasthan hence naturally what this transport does is that it increases the cost of freight which is then provided as subsidy by the government hence what government did is that it introduced a one nation one fertilizer scheme and through this scheme what government did was that it introduced a single bharat based brand for fertilizers and in what it does is that it reduces the demand for specifically branded fertilizers and hence in long term it will reduce the amount of freight cost which is used which is used for sub transporting these fertilizers now another initiative in this regard is the pm program for restoration awareness nourishment and amelioration of mother earth which is also known as pm pranam scheme and through this scheme what central government wants to do is that it wants to incentivize the state governments for balanced use of fertilizers and the and by balanced use of fertilizers the amount of saving which will result in financial subsidy burden this 50% of this saving it will be transferred back to state governments and state governments it can utilize this 50% of amount for promotion of alternate fertilizer as well as make farmers aware of other fertilizers as well hence through size reducing the size of urea bag introducing the soil health card scheme bringing neem coated urea as well as nano based urea bringing a single bharat branded under one fertilizer one nation scheme as well as pm pranam scheme to incentivize the state what government has done it has tried to reduce the burden of fiscal subsidy burden however there are also many steps that can be taken by the government to reduce this fiscal subsidy burden let us discuss these steps in the next slide now the first important recommendation in this regard is the need to deregulate the urea fertilizers and this can be done by two state two different steps in first step what the government can do is that it can decanalize the import of urea because imports of urea currently it is only undertaken by the government agencies and only when private agencies will be able to import these fertilizers then the supply of fertilizer will increase in our country thereby naturally reducing the cost of fertilizer specifically urea in the open market further it can also deregulate the mrp of urea and this deregulation when coupled with fixed subsidy it will incentivize these companies to reduce their production cost and by deregulation of urea government can further reduce its fertilizer subsidy bill also raw materials which are used for fertilizer production such as natural gas it is currently outside the purview of gst and these raw material are subjected to different taxes which leads to cascading of taxes now what is cascading of taxes it is a phenomena when there is a tax on one tax and then there is another tax on one tax hence this cascading it adds to the natural cost of subsidy also it also increases the cost of fertilizers in particular 
and hence by bringing natural gas under the gst regime what the government can do is that it can reduce the amount of taxes on the raw materials of fertilizers and this in long term will further reduce the cost of fertilizers for farmers and also what it will do is that it will incentivize local production of fertilizers and only when we produce fertilizers locally we can achieve an equilibrium of demand and supply and hence we will not be dependent on imports to to meet this demand gap further what government can do is that it can promote sustainability of chemical fertilizers and this means moving to a more organic based farming and in this regard paramparagat krishi vikas yojana which provides for encouragement of organic based farming is a step in a right direction and further what government can do is that it can promote the use of bio fertilizers further government can also increase its soil testing capacity as well as make farmers aware of the misuse of fertilizers and when farmers it will be provided with an adequate information related to the nutrition requirement they will be able to use precise fertilizers and in a very precise amount hence this will reduce the subsidy burden on the government in a more particular manner also what government can do is invest in research and development related to fertilizers as we have already seen through neem coated urea as well as nano urea it improved the nutrient use efficiency of fertilizers in particular and also similar steps in future it will further reduce the amount of fertilizers that are utilized by indian farmers hence by deregulating urea bringing raw materials specifically natural gas under the ambit of gst encouraging local production in india promoting sustainability by encouraging move towards bio fertilizers and organic farming improving soil testing facility and investing more in research and development will help government reduce its fertilizer requirement in general which will lead to reduce subsidy burden on government of india hence this was all for today's discussion on fertilizer subsidy now let us move to the next article of the day which appeared in both the hindu newspaper as well as the indian express now in the previous two months you must be aware that the issue of simultaneous election has cropped up in newspapers and this is because india currently it witnesses election every few months for example in the november that is next month india will witness elections in states such as rajasthan madhya pradesh as well as chatisgarh whereas in the next year that is 2024 india will witness lok sabha elections in the summer months hence we can see that india will witness two major election in a span of 5 to 6 months and this brings attention to the issue of simultaneous election now why are we discussing this simultaneous election in the first place it is because upsc in gs paper 2 it deals with the issue of representation of people act and how the election in india currently takes place also the issue of simultaneous election it cropped up in the previous year question of the year 2017 where a question specifically asked us to discuss the issue of simultaneous election now before moving into both benefits and criticisms of simultaneous election let us first understand what is this simultaneous election and let us understand this with a relatable example for example if you are a resident of old rajender nagar locality in this new delhi hence you come under new delhi lok sabha seat as well as rajender nagar seat of delhi legislative assembly hence currently what a voter of old rajender nagar does is that he votes for new delhi seat 
he last voted for new delhi lok sabha seat in the month of may of the year 2019 whereas the same voter he voted for rajender nagar seat in the month of february of the year 2020 but after this simultaneous election is introduced this particular voter will only have to go to the polling booth at one particular time and he will both and he will vote for both representatives of lok sabha as well as leg legislative assembly seats now naturally this comes with various challenges but let us first discuss why is there a need for simultaneous elections in the country in the first place now currently whenever there is an election in india this election is announced by the election commission of india and this means what is imposed is a model code of conduct which regulates the conduct of various political stakeholders and this model code of conduct is in place right from the time when election is announced to the time results are declared and this imposes several restrictions particularly on the ruling party and when model code of conduct is in action the ruling party it cannot undertake major policy announcement or not nor it could implement any major welfare or policy decision and this it leads to policy paralysis in the indian political system for a considerable part in the term of 5 years of the government further every election it imposes several implications on the political parties for example for campaigning purposes as well as conducting rallies political parties they require huge amount of money and political parties they secure these money from donors however when this money is not enough political parties what they do is they ask for money from criminal elements in the society hence we can say that huge election expenditure it increases the reliance of political parties on these criminal elements hence increasing the level of criminalization in the indian politics further every election we see the deployment of security forces primarily related to central arm police forces for example personnel of border security forces itbp as well as crpf they are deployed for election related duties and this means that the cadres of these particular forces they are diverted from their usual border related work to this election related work and this means that this security forces they are diverted from one state to another and by conducting less elections we can reduce the amount of diversion that the security forces currently faced with further frequent elections what we witness is that political parties they announce for freebies for example in many states political parties they promise that they will provide mobile phones laptop computers as well as common white goods such as mixer grinders to their votes if they come into power and this means that this populist measure it imposes huge cost on state exchequer hence it negatively affects the budget of any government also what we witness is that during elections political parties they appeal to their voters based on their identity for example they appeal to their voters based on caste based affiliation or religious based affiliation and this further perpetuates or increases the level of divide that already exists in indian society hence frequent elections what we can say is that they negatively affect the communal harmony of the indian society further this election it also imposes several invisible socio economic cost on indian society for example for election purposes administration and revenue machinery they are diverted for election related work as well as their vehicles are utilized for transporting security personnel 
as well as other election based staff also teachers who are government employees they are diverted from their school related work to election related work and this means that the welfare schemes in general they are not implemented in a proper manner or also what it does is that teachers they are moved away from their school related work thereby leads to reduced teaching hours and this in long term it negatively affects the socio economic status of any society hence by conducting election fewer times what we can do is we can limit the amount of diversion the personnel can take place hence reduce this invisible socio economic cost that are incurred currently however this issue of simultaneous election it is also faced with several criticisms first criticism it is related to synchronization of terms of various lok sabha as well as state legislative assembly for example currently many state assemblies and lok sabha they witness election in different times of year but there is also a constitutional limitation on these terms for example no two sessions can take place 6 months apart hence if we have to synchronize we need to delay or make the elections of these legislative assemblies early which is not currently possible in the current constitutional circumstances further even if we are able to achieve synchronization of these terms we will not be able to sustain the synchronization of these terms because currently any assembly can be dissolved prematurely hence even after we achieve synchronization this sustenance of the synchronization is currently difficult also this one nation simultaneous election concept it goes against the spirit of federalism because if we have to limit the amount of no confidence motion or the amount of premature dissolution that a state government can take place currently it limits the power of a state legislator to unseat their government hence it negatively affects the interest of state legislative assemblies further simultaneous election it will also impact the voter behavior in a negative manner because currently voters what they do is they have different preferences for both state as well as national elections for example in state of delhi voters currently they vote differently when it comes to state government and they vote in a different manner when it comes to national elections however with simultaneous election what these voters will be they will be confused between various state and national based issues hence their ability to vote in a impartial manner it will be negatively affected had the national elections they take place simultaneously with state based elections further the government of any state or central government it takes place it takes into account the voters decision when they make any decision hence with frequent elections what governments do that they take course correction in between midterm and this leads to improved policy as well as implementation of their welfare project which in general benefits the public interest as a whole however if we limit the amount of election that take place it will negatively affect the ability of people to hold their government accountable also simultaneous election it will pose significant logistical challenge on various stakeholders for example election commission of india it will have to secure more evms as well as vv pat voting machines whereas the home ministry it will have to utilize services of central armed police forces in an improved manner and all this movement throughout the country it will impose huge logistical challenge on any administration further as we have already discussed the state as well as national based issues will be entangled if this simultaneous elections happen and this means any national party will gain an unfair advantage 
over any regional parties. Because national parties, they can utilize the atmosphere which might be in their favor and it will go against the interest of any regional party who usually fights an election based on narrow state-based issues. Hence, in general, what we can say that simultaneous election, it is faced with various criticisms based on sustenance of synchronization. As it goes against federalism, it negatively impacts voters' behavior, reduces the ability of people to hold their government accountable, as well as several logistical challenges. And in this regard, let us discuss the recommendations which were made by various committees on this issue of simultaneous elections in particular. Now, the first recommendation, it comes from Parliamentary Standing Committee on Personnel as well as Law and Justice. And what this committee did was that it suggested a two-phase synchronization of elections in the country, wherein phase one, the elections of Lok Sabha as well as other legislative assemblies will take place, whereas in the second phase, the election, it will be held mid-term of a Lok Sabha. That means, 2.5 years after the Lok Sabha is elected, elections to other legislative assemblies, it will take place. Hence, it is envisaged by Parliamentary Standing Committee recommendation that elections in the country will take place every two and a half years. Further, what Election Commission of India, it suggested that there is a need to avoid premature dissolution of any state assemblies. And in this regard, what this Election Commission recommended that any no confidence motion, if it is brought in the house, it should be accompanied with a confidence motion. As this confidence motion, it will enable any alternative to be formed as a new government and an individual, he can be named as a prime minister of this new government. Hence, this election commission of India, it suggested that the premature dissolution should not take place. Further, Parliamentary Standing Committee, it also recommended with respect to schedule of by-elections in the country. And it said that by-elections of seats which are getting vacant in a one particular year, it can take place in a predetermined period every year. Hence, we can say that this Parliamentary Standing Committee, it suggested that the by-elections in the country should take place only once in a year at a predetermined period. Now, let us take a look at what Law Commission of India in its report suggested. And this Law Commission of India, it suggested that elections to legislative assemblies which are getting, whose term are ending within six months of general election, they can take place, elections to these legislative assemblies, it can take place with that of Lok Sabha elections. Hence, the results of these legislative assemblies, it can only be declared after the term of these particular legislative assembly ends. Hence, from this discussion, what we can conclude is a two-phase implementation of a simultaneous election. It is more desirable than taking a one-shot mechanism to a simultaneous election project. However, this still remains a Herculean task and therefore it will require coordination as well as collaboration between various stakeholders that exist in Indian political system. Hence, this was all for today's discussion on simultaneous election. Now let us move to the last article of the day which appeared in the explained section of the Indian Express newspaper. Now this article, it particularly deals with the Mahua Moitra case which has been referred to the Ethics Committee of Lok Sabha. And why are we dealing with this particular topic? It is because UPSC in GS Paper 2, it highlights that the conduct of business and privileges and issues arising out of workings of different state as well as central legislature. Further, the issue of committees, it crops up in UPSC exams frequently. 
For example, in the PYQ of the year 2018, what we saw was a question, it appeared on estimates committee. And in this regard, committee of ethics of Lok Sabha is an important topic for our mains exam. Hence, let us discuss what is this ethics committee of Lok Sabha in the first place. Now, Parliament of India, it provides for ethics committee for both Raj Sabha as well as Lok Sabha and these are two separate committees. And this Raj Sabha Ethics Committee, it was, it originated in the year of 1997, where a general purpose committee of parliament, it recommended an establishment of committee of ethics based on recommendation of NN Bora committee. Whereas the ethics committee of Lok Sabha in concern, it was constituted in the year of 2000 by the speaker of the house. And this was, and the origin of this committee, it can be traced back to the 1996 presiding officers conference. Hence, we can say that Parliament of India, it has two separate committees, one each for Raj Sabha and Lok Sabha respectively. Now, what is the purpose of such ethics committees? These ethics committee, what they do is that they oversee the conduct of MPs based on their moral and ethical conduct. And when these conducts are breached by a particular member, these committees, they also examine cases based on their misconduct of a particular MPs. Now, what is the procedure to make a complaint against a particular MP in case they breach their moral or ethical conduct? Now, this process, it involves complaint by a member of the house to the presiding officer of the house. And what this presiding officer does is that he refers this matter to the consideration of ethics committee of a particular house. And this ethics committee, what it does is that it call persons who are stakeholders of this particular complaint, including other stakeholders as well as the person who has made the complaint in the first place. And based on their Based on that declaration, what this committee does is that it makes an prima facie inquiry. And in this inquiry, it also considers the opinion of a person against whose the complaint has been made in the first place. As this process, it helps the committee to cross-examine the various allegations. And upon the consideration of these allegations, what this committee does is that it provides the house with a report and this report is submitted to the presiding officer of the house. And what this presiding officer does is that it presents this report for the consideration of the house. Hence, we can say that these committees, specifically ethics committee, they do not have the executive power to make punish, to punish a particular MP. Rather, what this committee does is that it makes recommendations in their reports and the ultimately it is the house that decides upon whether a particular misconduct, whether a particular MP who has been accused of misconduct, whether he will be punished or not. Now, let us discuss what are the features of various ethics committees of Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha respectively. Now, the membership of the Ethics Committee of Raj Sabha, it consists of 10 members who are nominated by the Chairman of the House. Now, the tenure of this Raj Sabha Ethics Committee, it is a indefinite tenure as this committee, it will, it will hold the office until the new committee is appointed. Whereas the Lok Sabha Ethics Committee is concerned, it consists of at maximum 15 members who are nominated by the Speaker of the House. However, the tenure of this Ra Lok Sabha Ethics Committee, it is limited to that of one year and this committee is reconstituted again after the period of one year. Now, as now, with respect to the functions of this Raj Sabha committee, 
what this committee does is that it oversees the moral and ethical conduct of its respective members and it prepares what is called a code of conduct for regulation of the behavior of different members and it also examines the breach of conduct based on the code of conduct itself further this committee it also prepares a register of interest as this register of interest it consists of every business or professional interest that a particular mp has and this register of interest it helps the committee to determine whether this particular member has committed a breach of their private interest it with respect to their public interest whereas the function of this lok sabha committee is concerned it takes a certain similar manner as it examines the complaint which are made to this particular committee and it also can formulate a code of conduct however with respect to powers of these committees are concerned there's a considerable difference because rat sabha ethics committee it has brought forward a code of conduct and it also maintains a register of interest whereas the lok sabha committee is concerned it has not brought forward any code of conduct neither it maintains a register of interest hence we can say that lok sabha ethics committee it is less effective than rat sabha ethics committee and this was all for today's discussion of daily news simplified you are requested to stay tuned to our rouse is youtube channel for more updates thank you and have a good night